so important. Well, not only are we visiting, uh, wounds are accessible, uh, after strong bodies are hard, heart valves are hard, sinuses are hard to get to, but, but wounds are chronic infections of skeletal skin structures, and we can use that to, uh, uh, to find out the basic principles of the host micro interaction in this kind of infection, and then take those, uh, those principles that we learn in wounds and apply them across the other uh, types of chronic infections. Chronic wounds are chronic infections, that is not something science. That, that is, that's the, the shift that's taking place in the wound care community. So this is the patient that was sent to me from in Mexico with the provider called me up and said, I have this patient with hydrophobic cancerosum and this patient has a chronic granulation tissue and you know, we, we watched this woman for three or four months and it's just eating into her leg and we need something done. But we know we can't agree because you don't get pretty the uh, hydroma. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the, uh, the for you that, that, that don't know about pyrodermal gangrenosum, if you agree it, it causes a, a pathogen response, a hyperinflammatory response that causes tissue damage that makes it going to get worse. But this is not regulation tissue, this is dead tissue. Now, what, the reason I use this patient as an illustration is we want to talk about the, the host being the, the, the root of or the cause of the chronic uh, one, the diabetes, poor circulation, uh, the pensive pressure, uh, neuropathy, uh, you know, to, uh, to impair the immune system. And the list goes on and on. There's always they're thinking about the host as a reason. Well, this lady doesn't have any of those things. She has low autoimmune diseases or whatever. When she has this bacteria eating down into her flesh. So we did do uh, the treatment, but we did the treatment button and controlled the micro because we had a diagnostic test. And then within about three and a half months, you see the, the uh, picture to the right, we had granulation tissue, and that's granular. You see the little box grains, and you see the red color and stuff. So there is no such thing as chronic granulation tissue. But at the end of the day, it's not host impairments that cause this one. It's a chronic infection that causes the one. So, I would put that on the beginning. Uh, you have a defect in through the skin, you've got this deep cavity down into the subcutaneous tissue tendon, uh, the muscle, and stuff like that. And there, there's no question that there's no bacteria in that. Okay, so that bacteria can do one of three things. It can do something positive, like a commensal. It can help that one heal. Well, commensals have communication with the host. They have specific cells that communicate with them, specific cytokines, and those mechanisms are more robust than we ever would imagine. Well, the, the, the muscle tendon bone subcutaneous tissue doesn't contain those cells, doesn't contain those cytokines, so there can never be commensals developed. In fact, it's a permissive environment. And we want to push back when we say, well, this is caused by staph and permanence, this one. That, that's what's infected. They say, well, that's commensal. It cannot cause infection. That's not true. It, 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 it's not infected when it's under host control. But when it gets in that permissive environment, surely it can cause infection. Uh, the other thing, it, the factor you can do is just be a contaminant. Um, and, and like this, um, uh, picture here, this is uh, some uh, extracellular matrix of the host, and there's a single bacteria there, and that's what you expect. You expect a few single cell or little clusters of bacteria to spread out on, on the wound bed, and they're not doing any harm, and, and we know where to contain it is. So then what do you do about this? In this one, uh, we have rods. We have some, some very small cocci down here. Uh, we have some bigger cocci uh, uh, in other places. So this is a polymicrobial group of bacteria. You, you see this, these strands of material uh, that are binding it to the host surface. Well, that's host protein. That's my uh, that's just been formalized the vibrant and it weaves itself in. It also puts a, a coat of uh, sugar around itself, so there's a matrix of so that is a lava. It's polymicrobial. It's encased in matrix material and it's attached to a surface. Okay, so, so these, this is a way the bacteria grows that's fundamentally different than individual planktonic bacteria. Again, the individual planktonic bacteria in day tissue, digest tissue, uh, and, and uh, had a slash of burn predatory type of strategy to cause infection and then so you see things like cellulitis or, or uh, strep throat or uh, sepsis and, and a single course of antibodies makes you that because they're not protected. What we'll talk about in the whole is this community of bacteria that's encased in a self secreted matrix that's bound down to the surface with host proteins that, that expresses a, a, a vastly different uh, part of its genome. So it, it's more like a caterpillar versus a butterfly for the, for the iconic bacteria. So these are radically different than the bacteria that you learned about microbiology. Uh, causing infection. But the strategy is quite different also. It, it has to stay secure to the surface. If it eats the surface, it, it will be released to the environment and it will fail. But if it inflames the surface, it can have plasma exudate that comes out and that's what eats the lava. So it's a different infection strategy. And the question is, is can bacteria, can this bacteria cause what we see in particles? Can it cause the wound to be delayed? Can it cause the wound to uh, or that sloppy exudate? Can, it, can we see all the chronic wound behaviors? directly explained by this uh, material that's on the surface of the wound? Well, the answer is yes. Now, this is slide. These are slides from uh, North, uh, Northwestern, uh, Dr. Musto, Dr. Galliano. Uh, I got to present right after Dr. Galliano, and, and I said, can I get those slides? Because he was using a term called biofilm way back in 2008. And basically, uh, what he was showing was in their rabbit ear model, they could uh, breed uh, these little punched out wounds and, and, and impair the circulation to the ear. And then 24 hours later, slug would reform. And they didn't cause slug. What they called it was biofilm. So uh, what they did 
view of it, look at this microscopically, they touch out those little holes and they follow those. And on day three, what they found was that uh, this, this granulation gap, the, the base of the wound that they had touched out before, was, was significantly bigger for uh, uh, the cloud cell than for the control house significantly. It was 0. 0.0001. So there's no question that the presence of the slot, the presence of the valve cell, delayed the healing of the mouse wound. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an important point to take forward. So uh, remembering this work and, and looking forward and then looking backwards at Cox's work way back in the 1800s, 1860s, uh, so what we wanted to do is use uh, a rational way to say, does the microbiota on the surface of the world, the polymicrobial bile cell that we find on human wounds, is that the cause of the human wound, or is it, is it the host factors that cause that? And so I think this is a definitive study for that. So basically, in a house model, you uh, identify the microorganism in, uh, in the disease person. You identify it, you, uh, you uh, purify it in pure culture. Uh, you put it into the animal model, causing the same disease, and then you recover the bacteria. So that's what we did. Uh, but instead of pure culture, we took the bowel film intact and seeded it uh, into the uh, uh, mouse wound. And so, uh, uh, on day zero, uh, that, that was a homogenized amount of slump that was harvested from a human patient, from a human wound. And then on day four, uh, if you could see that uh, in the, the mice that were seeded, uh, that there was significant slump uh, that was developed. There was significant exudate. There was significant delay to healing. And so we know we created the same disease in the mouse model. Then uh, on day, a uh, few days later, we harvested the bacteria. We correlated the back to the bacteria that was originally taken off the host and found that we had the same group of organisms that we started with in the human wound. Uh, there was nearly a, a, there was a very high correlation. Whereas in controls, uh, the wound healed normally. Uh, there, was, there was no uh, significant slump, no significant exudate, and no delay over what they would expect from a few wound in the mouse. So, I mean, that's good science. Uh, that, that, that shows that the microbiota that's on the surface of a chronic wound, the microbiota that, that's involved in any chronic infection, is the cause of that infection. And we can have a host uh, factor matter. We can augment uh, host defenses and we can help the host. But at the end of the day, it's the microbiota that, that's the main problem in these chronic infections. So I use this slide to uh, talk about wound care, but it applies to all chronic infections, and that's the sad truth. The chronic infections are adequately diagnosed. 99.9% .9 of, of chronic infections that are, that are currently uh, present in, in U.S. citizens today uh, are they're not diagnosed. Because if you get a diagnostic test, it does not help in the treatment of that disease. So in wound care, we take very few cultures. Uh, in, uh, uh, in sinus, very few cultures. They love it in outputs. I mean, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not like we're treating an infectious disease. It, 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 we're, it, we might check the exacerbation or something, but it's not the routine diagnostic test in this chronic infection. And so for every mistake, we're not knowing how to make, we're not looking. We don't look, and it's because our diagnostic test, the, 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 the clinical culture that most physicians use, don't lead to better outcomes. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, we get the test, we, we get a report, it usually tells us one or two things, we treat those one or two things, and the wound doesn't get better, the sinus doesn't get better, uh, the heart valve doesn't get better, uh, you know, it, 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 it fails, and it's because of the limitation of the diagnostic test. A little over two years ago, I was reading a throwaway journal, don't even know the name of it, I, I got this picture of it, but what the author said, uh, the, kind of this uh, rang, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it got me passionate about this. What he said was, well, what if we couldn't culture all the bacteria? Well, basically, that's admitting that we can't culture all the bacteria, and each one of us know that. We know the limitations. Some bacteria go very slowly. Some need different nutrients. You know, the bacteria need a different environment. Uh, you know, it, it's difficult to grow bacteria. I've heard estimates like 99% of bacteria can't be cultured. I've heard estimates that 85% can't be cultured, but there's, there's a large group of bacteria that can't. I want to look at that picture because that is what Koch was fighting way back when he started. What he found was he moved things off the tables and, and other uh, media. Uh, he found that he, he, he obtained polymicrobial communities. And, and he made the decision then that, that no, it's just a single organism, and I think the pure culture of that single thing was causing the disease. Okay? And we're locked into that today. And that, that was a, 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 a bias that was put into microbiology and the clinical medicine over 100 years ago. So we want to change that because wild milk inherently is polymicrobial. It's multiple different species that reside in a single community, much like these uh, different communities you see on the plate. So by its very origins, the, 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 uh, the petri dish, the auger, the nutrients that were used, put a bias into finding a single organism. And the nutrients that we put in and the biases, we want to find gram-positive aerobic bacteria. So guess what we find in our house? We find that. And we can see that in this 
uh, diagram here. This data is uh, getting a little bit old. This was 2003, but this is a culture show. And what you're seeing is, as you break into that 30%, what this is showing is that about 60 to 65% of the bacteria that were identified in 1,400 samples were gram positive or bacteria. There's no antelopes in there. Uh, so the is underrepresented. There, there's very few gram negatives. So it's, you know, that's the highest of the culture. That, that is not the reality of the microbes on the world. That's, that's what we would get at. So we realized that. And so we went out in the literature and said, you know, how can we identify what, what, what microorganisms are present in the world? And we can do it with great sensitivity and great specificity. And that's when the Human Microbiome Project data came out. Now, here are those statistics that I was talking about. You, know, you can prove anything with those, but what, the bottom line of uh, what the Human Micro, Microbiome Project came up with was 16S can, can help us identify what bacteria is there, and it can give us a relative quantification of, of which one's there. Now, the whole genome surveys uh, that probably show a little bit better uh, in this uh, data down here, but uh, there, that's a lot more expensive to do with 16S. So, but now that, that data is coming along, and now uh, with newer uh, methodologies, the, the, the past the, the back proteomics, the, uh, the uh, different uh, and deeper methods for uh, sequencing, uh, the whole journal is more data is coming online to not only identify microorganisms, but identify uh, resistant mobile genetic resistance factors, and also to help us with quantitative information. So it's becoming, it's evolving, it's getting cheaper, and uh, it's giving us more and more information as we go along. I won't call myself out as an expert in my sort methods. I'm the, I'm the guy that uses it, I'm trying to get context for how important this is, and how, how revolutionary, how this can move the ball in managing chronic infections. But one of the old old technologies, and this must be 30 years old, uh, is it's 35, uh, is, is real-time PCR. And the thing about real-time PCR is if you go to the infection points, you can find the CC number, and you run some uh, run the data on your uh, uh, plate, you can work backwards based on the anomalous you extract it to uh, you know, ballpark figure of how many uh, uh, individual uh, microbial cells are present in that sample. So you basically can say, you know, uh, you can get one of those exponential numbers of positions for so much. Uh, so, you know, we can send a depth or send the fourth of depth of, of such and such. So it gives you an idea of how much bacteria you have in the sample. Uh, it varies with the sampling methods. It varies with uh, if there's a heterogeneity uh, in chronic infection on where the bacteria is present. But in the end, it gives you a pretty good measure of how much bacteria you're dealing with. And we call that bacterial load. If that, if that goes significantly up or it goes significantly down, you kind of have a, uh, a feel for how effective your treatment is. So uh, we like real-time PCR, uh, mainly for universal 16S, but also can tell us what bacteria is there. With, uh, and, uh, you know, if, if I know that brush is present, if I know that pseudomonas is present, if I know that nine-minus resistance is present, I can, I can also buy that and period therapy on day one instead of you know, a week later or two weeks later. So if, if, if PCR has the advantage of uh, rapid turnaround, and uh, it can tell us about specific targets, and it has the absolute quantitative ability to tell us it, and how much is there. Or sequencing is more relative. Uh, the quantification there is it says, well, it's 30% this, 20% that, but you don't know what the total is, and, and, but still it tells you what your dominant bug is. So we looked at 3,000 different ones, this new data, and what we found was that is indeed present, and, and, and it's just pretty solid. But uh, by uh, uh, number four, we have uh, uh, anaerobes, and down here we have uh, propionic bacteria and the pe pep So, so anaerobic species are breaking into our top ten, and yet we, we've never been able to culture with clinical cultures of uh, these bacteria, uh, and uh, we've never really been able to manage them. Clinically, we can't see if we've impacted them in any way. Now we have a diagnostic test that does that. Okay. So, and then the other thing is, is these are powered microbial. But if we, we usually treat at a genus level, and so what we did was we. Uh, resolved all these different species for Staphylococcus into a single uh, a group. And what we found was that over 63% of the time there is a staph species. And that doesn't mean that it's, it's a major thing. But what, uh, what was quite interesting was Craig Bacterium became number two now. And that's a brand positive micro. Supermonas still kept its position, but now we've got four different uh, anaerobes uh, that, that, that come to, to the top. And they're 25% uh, of wounds. Uh, pretty much respectively. So animals are a huge part of these chronic infections. Now we're looking at uh, uh, atherosclerotic plaque, we're looking at sinuses, we're looking at heart valves, and the animals are there. So they're going to be a much bigger part of that than we, than we had ever expected. And now we have a tool that will actually identify those things. So, so this, is, this is critical. Uh, and for each uh, different chronic infection, this information is being obtained. So let's look at culture versus uh, the, the uh, molecular methods. And what we found in 50% of the patients where we sent a sample uh, to a uh, university laboratory, we sent a sample to a molecular diagnostic laboratory, we kept a sample for referee. What we found was, and uh, if we look at cultures, we found 97 different organisms cultured. Five was the most number of uh, species that were identified in any single uh, sample. Well, if we look at the molecular 
compared to that uh, molecular failed. So I had my seven of the bacteria that were in that. We sent that to the refereeing laboratory, and what we found was they were never, those were contaminants that were picked up during the uh, cleaning and, and uh, culturing methods. We also found that about 17% or minor things, these are things that are two to three orders of magnitude less than the rest of the bacteria uh, within the wound uh, or within the sample. So that, that, that goes to the growth bias of cultures. Now, when we look at uh, <laughs> when we look at uh, uh, molecular methods and we exclude the anaerobic bacteria, just apples to apples, aerobic, what we find is we find five times as much bacteria. We find way more dominant bacteria than culture found. And uh, even if we take off all the minor uh, bacteria, we're still at 250 important species that need to be treated. So basically, it's not that cultures are wrong. They're just incomplete, and they're so incomplete, they don't solve our, our diagnostic problem. This is why there has to be a shift from culture to molecular. The resistance to uh, uh, taking a molecular diagnostic is basically this chart right here. When the doctor gets back that uh, there's 10, 8, 12 different significant microorganisms in the blood, what do you do with that? So how do you treat that? And that's for another lecture, but just real briefly, if you can collapse those different genuses uh, into, into, into antibody treatment groups, you see you come up with one or two, three antibiotics that will cover the entire community. And so if you're not treating one group and allowing another group to grow up and take over the space. So it's not as difficult as it's you know, as intimidating first, but really it gets to be quite easy. All right, so that's our hope and change. You know, it's, 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 there's, there's clinical cultures that have been present for over 100 years. They're geared towards planktonic single cell organisms. They're, they're, they're geared towards uh, uh, gram positive aerobic bacteria. And then on the right, we have bioinformatics that can take the information from whatever platform you want to look at. I mean, there's a number of sequencing platforms from PacBio to Ion Torrent to, to uh, Illumina to you, know, you name it. And, and they're different, and they, they yield slightly different results, but, but far more accurate than any culture results. And, and the computers can sort out some of those differences. But at the end of the day, the, 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 uh, the molecular methods give us data that's actionable, that changes and, and, and drastically improves the outcome of uh, management of chronic infections. So the, the, that's the guts 